Suetonius, whose father had fought for Otho at Bedriacum, gives an unfavorable account of Vitellius' rise and brief and cruel administration in the, the lives of the Twelve Caesars. Tacitus disagrees with some of Suetonius' assertions, even though their own accounts of Vitellius are scarcely positive ones. Book 1 The Rise of Vitellius Tacitus writes The city was in a panic. The alarm aroused by the recent atrocious crime and by Otho's well-known proclivities was further increased by the fresh news about Vitellius. This news had been suppressed before Galba's murder, and it was believed that only the army of Upper Germany had revolted. Now when they saw that the two men in the world who were most notorious for immorality, indolence, and extravagance had been, as it were, appointed by providence to ruin the empire, not only the senators and knights who had some stake and interest in the country, but the masses as well, openly deplored their fate. Their talk was no longer of the horrors of the recent bloody peace, they reverted to the records of the civil wars, the taking and retaking of Rome by her own troops, the devastation of Italy, the pillage of the provinces, the battles of Pharsalia, Philippi, Perusia, and Matina, those bywords of national disaster. The world was turned upside down, they mused, even when good men fought for the throne, yet the Roman Empire survived the victories of Julius Caesar and of Augustus, as the Republic would have survived had Pompey and Brutus been victorious. But now, are we to go and pray for Otho or for Vitellius? To pray for either would be impious. It would be wicked to offer vows for the success of either in a war of which we can only be sure that the winner will prove the worse. Some cherished hopes of Vespasian and the armies of the East, he was preferable to either of the others, still they shuddered at the thought of a fresh war and fresh bloodshed. Besides, Vespasian's reputation was doubtful. He was the first emperor who ever changed for the better. I must now explain the origin and causes of the rising of Vitellius. After the slaughter of Julius and his whole force, the troops were in high spirits at the fame and booty they had acquired. Without toil or danger they had won a most profitable victory. So they were all for marching against the enemy, plunder seemed better than pay. They had endured a long and unprofitable service, rendered the more irksome by the country and climate and by the strict discipline observed. But discipline, however stern in time of peace, is always relaxed in civil wars, when temptation stands on either hand and treachery goes unpunished. Men, armor, and horses they had in abundance for use and for show. But, whereas before the war the soldiers only knew the men of their own company or troop, and the provincial frontier separated the armies, now, having once joined forces against, they had gained a knowledge of their own strength and the state of the province, and were looking for more fighting and fresh quarrels, calling the Gauls no longer allies, as before, but our enemies, or the vanquished. They had also the support of the Gallic tribes on the banks of the Rhine, who had espoused their cause and were now the most eager to rouse them against the Galbians, as they now called them, despising the name of. So, cherishing hostility against the Sequani and Adui, and against all the other communities in proportion to their wealth, they drank in dreams of sacking towns and pillaging fields and looting houses, inspired partly by the peculiar failings of the strong greed and vanity and partly also by a feeling of irritation at the insolence of the Gauls, who boasted, to the chagrin of the army, that Galba had remitted a quarter of their tribute and given the franchise and grants of land to their community. Further fuel was added by a rumor, cunningly circulated and rashly credited, that there was a project on foot to decimate the legions and discharge all the most enterprising centurions. From every side came alarming news and sinister reports from the city. The colony of Lugunum was up in arms, and its stubborn attachment to Nero made it a hotbed of rumor. But in the camp itself the passions and fears of the soldiers, and, when once they had realized their strength, their feeling of security, furnished the richest material for lies and won them easy credence. In the preceding year, shortly after the beginning of December, Aulus Vitellius had entered the province of Lower Germany and held a careful inspection of the winter quarters of the legions. He restored many to their rank, remitted degrading penalties, and relieved those who had suffered disgrace, acting mainly from ambitious motives, but partly also upon sound judgment. Amongst other things he showed impartiality in remedying the injustices due to the mean and dishonest way in which Fontius Capito had issued promotions and reductions. The soldiers did not judge Vitellius' actions as those of a mere ex-consul, they took him for something more, and, while serious critics found him undignified, his supporters spoke of his affability and beneficence, because he showed neither moderation nor judgment in making presents out of his own money and squandering other people's. 
Besides, they were so greedy for power that they took even his vices for virtues. In both armies there were plenty of quiet, law-abiding men as well as many who were unprincipled and disorderly. But for sheer reckless cupidity none could match two of the legionary legates, Aelianus Cassina and Fabius Valens. Valens was hostile to Galba, because, after unmasking Virginius's hesitation and thwarting Capito's designs, he considered that he had been treated with ingratitude, so he incited Vitellius by pointing out to him the enthusiasm of the troops. You, he would say to him, are famous everywhere, and you need find no obstacle in Hordianius Flaccus. Britain will join and the German auxiliaries will flock to your standard. Galba cannot trust the provinces, the poor old man holds the empire on sufferance, the transfer can be soon effected, if only you will clap on full sail and meet your good fortune halfway. Virginius was quite right to hesitate. He came of a family of knights, and his father was a nobody. He would have failed, had he accepted the empire, his refusal saved him. Your father was thrice consul, and he was censor with an emperor for his colleague. That gives you imperial dignity to start with, and makes it unsafe for you to remain a private citizen. These promptings stirred Vitellius' sluggish nature to form desires, but hardly hopes. Cassina, on the other hand, in Upper Germany, was a handsome youth, whose big build, imperious spirit, clever tongue, and upright carriage had completely won the hearts of the soldiers. While Quester in Baetica he had promptly joined Galba's party, and in spite of his youth had been given command of a legion. Later he was convicted of misappropriating public funds, and, on Galba's orders, prosecuted for peculation. Highly indignant, Cassina determined to embroil the world and bury his own disgrace in the ruins of his country. Nor were the seeds of dissension lacking in the army. The entire force had taken part in the war against, nor was it until after Nero's death that they joined Galba's side, and even then they had been forestalled in swearing allegiance by the detachments of Lower Germany. Then again the Treviri and Lingwans and the other communities which Galba had punished by issuing harsh edicts and confiscating part of their territory, were in close communication with the winter quarters of the legions. They began to talk treason, the soldiers degenerated in civilian society, it only wanted someone to avail himself of the offer they had made to Virginius. Following an ancient custom, the tribe of the Lingwans had made a present of a pair of silver hands to the legions as a symbol of hospitality. Assuming an appearance of squalid misery, their envoys made the round of the officers' quarters and the soldiers' tents complaining of their own wrongs and of the rewards lavished on neighboring tribes. Finding the soldiers ready to listen, they made inflammatory allusions to the army itself, its dangers and humiliation. Mutiny was almost ripe, when Hordianius Flaccus ordered the envoys to withdraw, and, in order to secure the secrecy of their departure, gave instructions to them to leave the camp by night. This gave rise to an alarming rumor. Many declared that the envoys had been killed, and that, if they did not look out for themselves, the leading spirits among the soldiers, who had complained of the present state of things, would be murdered in the dark, while their comrades knew nothing about it. So the legions formed a secret compact. The auxiliaries were also taken into the plot, although at first they had been distrusted, because their infantry and cavalry had been posted in camp all round the legions' quarters as though an attack on him were meditated. However, they soon showed themselves the keener conspirators. Disloyalty is a better bond for war than it ever proves in peace. In Lower Germany, however, the legions on the 1st of January swore the usual oath of allegiance to Galba, though with much hesitation. Few voices were heard even in the front ranks, the rest were silent, each waiting for his neighbor to take some bold step. Human nature is always ready to follow where it hates to lead. However, the feelings of the legions varied. The first and fifth were already mutinous enough to throw a few stones at Galba's statue. The fifteenth and sixteenth dared not venture beyond muttered threats, but they were watching to see the outbreak begin. In Upper Germany, on the other hand, on the very same day, the fourth and the twenty-second legions, who were quartered together, smashed their statues of Galba to atoms. The fourth took the lead, the twenty-second at first holding back, but eventually making common cause with them. They did not want it to be thought that they were shaking off their allegiance to the empire, so in taking the oath they invoked the long obsolete names of the Senate and people of Rome. None of the officers made any movement for Galba, and indeed some of them, as happens in such outbreaks, headed the rebellion. However, nobody made any kind of set speech or mounted the platform, for there was no one as yet with whom to curry favor. The ex-consul Hordianius Flaccus stood by and watched their treachery. He had not the courage to check the storm or even to rally the waverers and encourage the faithful. Sluggish and cowardly, it was mere indolence that kept him loyal. 
Four centurions of the 22nd legion, Nonius Receptus, Donatius Valens, Romilius Marcellus, and Calpurnius Repentinus, who tried to protect Galba's statues, were swept away by the rush of the soldiers and put under arrest. No one retained any respect for their former oath of allegiance, or even remembered it, and, as happens in mutinies, they were all on the side of the majority. On the night of the 1st of January a standard bearer of the 4th legion came to Cologne, and brought the news to Vitellius at his dinner that the 4th and 22nd legions had broken down Galba's statues and sworn allegiance to the Senate and people of Rome. As this oath was meaningless, it seemed best to seize the critical moment and offer them an emperor. Vitellius dispatched messengers to inform his own troops and generals that the army of the upper province had revolted from Galba, so they must either make war on the rebels immediately or, if they preferred peace and unity, make an emperor for themselves, and there was less danger, he reminded them, in choosing an emperor than in looking for one. The quarters of the first legion were nearest at hand, and Fabius Valens was the most enterprising of the generals. On the following day he entered Cologne with the cavalry of his legion and auxiliaries, and saluted Vitellius as emperor. The other legions of the province followed suit, vying with each other in enthusiasm, and the army of the upper province, dropping the fine-sounding titles of the Senate and people of Rome, joined Vitellius on the 3rd of January, which clearly showed that on the two previous days they were not really at the disposal of a republican government. The inhabitants of Cologne and the Treviri and Lingwans, rivaling the zeal of the troops, made offers of assistance or of horses or arms or money, each according to the measure of their strength, wealth or enterprise. And these offers came not only from the civil and military authorities, men who had plenty of money to spare and much to hope from victory, but whole companies or individual soldiers handed over their savings, or, instead of money, their belts, or the silver ornaments on their uniforms, some carried away by a wave of enthusiasm, some acting from motives of self-interest. Vitellius accordingly commended the zeal of the troops. He distributed among Roman knights the court offices which had been usually held by freedmen, paid the centurions their furlough fees out of the imperial purse, and for the most part conceded the soldiers' savage demands for one execution after another, though he occasionally cheated them by pretending to imprison their victims. Thus Pompeius Propinquus, the imperial agent in Belgica, was promptly executed, while Julius Burdo, who commanded the fleet on the Rhine, was adroitly rescued. The indignation of the army had broken out against him, because he was supposed to have intrigued against Fontius Capito, and to have accused him falsely. Capito's memory was dear to the army, and when violence reigns murder may show its face, but pardon must be stealthy. So Burdo was kept in confinement and only released after victory had allayed the soldiers' rancor. Meanwhile a centurion, named Crispinus, was offered as a scapegoat. He had actually stained his hands with Capito's blood, so his guilt seemed more obvious to those who clamored for his punishment, and Vitellius felt he was a cheaper sacrifice. Julius Civilis was the next to be rescued from danger. He was all-powerful among the Batavi, and Vitellius did not want to alienate so spirited a people by punishing him. Besides, eight cohorts of Batavian troops were stationed among the Lingwans. They had been an auxiliary force attached to the 14th, and in the general disturbance had deserted the legion. Their decision for one side or the other would be of the first importance. Nonius, Donatius, Romilius, and Calpurnius, the centurions mentioned above, were executed by order of Vitellius. They had been convicted of loyalty, a heinous offense among deserters. His party soon gained the accession of Valerius Asiaticus, governor of Belgica, who subsequently married Vitellius' daughter, and of Junius Blasius, governor of the Lions Division of Gaul, who brought with him the Italian legion and a regiment of cavalry known as Taurus Horse, which had been quartered at Lugunum. The forces in Rhaetia lost no time in joining his standard, and even the troops in Britain showed no hesitation. Trebellius Maximus, the governor of Britain, had earned by his meanness and cupidity the contempt and hatred of the army, which was further inflamed by the action of his old enemy Rocius Celius, who commanded the 20th legion, and they now seized the opportunity of the civil war to break out into a fierce quarrel. Trebellius blamed Celius for the mutinous temper and insubordination of the army, Celius complained that Trebellius had robbed his men and impaired their efficiency. Meanwhile their unseemly quarrel ruined the discipline of the forces, whose insubordination soon came to a head. The auxiliary horse and foot joined in the attacks on the governor, and rallied round Celius. Trebellius, thus hunted out and abandoned, took refuge with Vitellius. The province remained quiet, despite the removal of the ex-consul. 
the government was carried on by the commanding officers of the legions, who were equal in authority, though Celius's audacity gave him an advantage over the rest. Thus reinforced by the army from Britain, Vitellius, who now had an immense force and vast resources at his disposal, decided on an invasion by two routes under two separate generals. Fabius Valens was to lure the Gauls to his standard, or, if they refused, to devastate their country, and then invade Italy by way of the Cottian Alps. Cassina was to follow the shorter route and descend into Italy over the Pennine Pass. Valens column comprised the 5th Legion with its eagle, and some picked detachments from the army of Lower Germany, together with auxiliary horse and foot, amounting in all to 40,000 men. Cassina's troops from Upper Germany numbered 30,000, their main strength consisting in the 21st Legion. Both columns were reinforced by German auxiliaries, whom Vitellius also recruited to fill up his own army, intending to follow with the main force of the attack. Strange was the contrast between Vitellius and his army. The soldiers were all eagerness, clamoring for battle at once, while Gaul was still frightened and Spain still undecided. Winter was no obstacle to them, peace and delay were for cowards, they must invade Italy and seize Rome, haste was the safest course in civil war, where action is better than deliberation. Vitellius was dully apathetic, anticipating his high station by indulging in idle luxury and lavish entertainments. At midday he would be drunk and drowsy with overeating. However, such was the zeal of the soldiers that they even did the general's duties, and behaved exactly as if he had been present to encourage the alert and threaten the laggards. They promptly fell in and began to clamor for the signal to start. The title of Germanicus was then and there conferred on Vitellius, Caesar he would never be called, even after his victory. Civil war between the factions of Otho and Vitellius takes hold, as we continue on the next chapter of the histories by Tacitus. Please hit the like button if you are enjoying these videos. And don't forget to subscribe to Classic Masterworks.